Ready? Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kent Glover and my project is looking at the larval growth and improved culture methods of the potter's angelfish. Um, I did this research at the Oceanic Institute with my advisor, Dr. Chad Cowan. So the aquarium industry is a multi-billion dollar industry around the globe, valued at $15 billion globally, 300 million in the US, and the reef aquarium industry or fishery in Hawaii was valued at $2.3 million annually. So in 2021, this fishery was shut down by the state of Hawaii. This shut down a fishery that exported endemic species from Hawaii, meaning that species like yellow tang and potter's angel fish were no longer available at all for the aquarium trade. Um, these fish were exported in huge numbers, over 300,000 yellow tang each year and over 10,000 potter's angel fish. And sadly, due to the um, process of catching these fish and transporting them, many of them died, as you can see in the top right. Um, so luckily, in recent years, the yellow tang has been successfully aqu aquacultured at the Oceanic Institute and brought to commercial production. So like I said, through this collection ban, there was no more availability of yellow tang, potter's angelfish, and other Hawaiian endemic species. The only way to get these species for the aquarium trade is through aquaculture. Um, a little bit about ornamental aquaculture, it's the raising of ornamental species or non-food fish species uh, for the aquarium trade. Um, it's a very intensive process. Uh, it includes the live culture of many, many small organisms such as algae, copepods, rotifers, uh, artemia or brine shrimp, and other live prey items. So we basically have to recreate anything that a fish would experience in the ocean, it has to experience in the tank, and that includes its food and in um, environmental conditions. Um, so ornamental aquaculture can reduce the pressure on wild populations because we don't have to take these fish out of the ocean since we can just raise them in captivity. And also understanding the complex life histories and larval durations of these species can really help uh, management decisions in the future. So for my project, I was able to collect Potter's angelfish eggs from our broodstock tanks at the Oceanic Institute every morning. I was able to collect them, count them by subsampling, and um, categorize them by unviable or viable eggs. So in the top right, you can see two unviable eggs. One was fertilized, uh, but unviable, one was unfertilized, and then a fully viable developed clear egg. These were then separated, uh, and I took just the viable eggs and uh, stocked them into 200 liter and 1,000 liter rearing tanks. Uh, these were then given a prescribed rearing protocol, and during these, this protocol basically gives when we feed what food. So as you can see on the bottom left over here, we have the different feeds on the y-axis and the time or days post, or the, in days post hatch on the x-axis. So from three days to 50 days post hatch, they were given X. That's sort of how it works. So each tank was given a protocol like this and they were expanded on um, for each protocol. In total, there were five protocols used. Um, we started with a protocol that was designed to raise yellow tang, and then a protocol that was designed to raise other, uh, a wide var variation of aquarium species, and we adjusted these protocols based on our findings um, from those trials, which ended up with protocols C A through E. Um, so each protocol was then subsampled throughout its duration, and I was able to get the morphometric measurements, as you can see in the top right. I was able to get body length and body depth for each larvae, and I was also able to get survivability um, to about 32 days post-hatch. And here you can see some of the small prey items that we feed, rotifers, artemia, and copepod noclei, and then adult copepods. So these are very, very small microscopic organisms that we have to feed these fish constantly to make sure that they survive. So we were able to see that 
the part of the angelfish is able to be uh, captive bred to, uh, to production levels. Uh, this was the first time that this was ever done. And through this, um, we were able to see that flexion, which is a period of increased development and um, growth, uh, body depth growth for the part of the angelfish was from 14 days to 24 days post-hatch. Um, as you can see, the larvae get a lot deeper. They uh, become a lot more developed. Uh, their air bladder inflates, as you can see clearly in the 21 days post-hatch larvae. Um, so it's a very, very critical time. And this lines up with other species like the yellow tang, which experiences it about um, 15 days post-hatch. Um, as you can see from egg to larva to settlement takes about 60 to 90 days. This is also pretty consistent with other reef species, a little longer, um, but it uh, makes sense because it's found that the part of angelfish, um, is, it, since it's endemic to Hawaii, it doesn't have a long larval duration, so it can't um, expand its range. Um, also during the, during the um, trial, it was seen that large mortality events uh, were seen when starting new feeds. This was kind of interesting in some cases because the larvae were seen to be able to eat this prey item. However, the addition of the prey item seemed to stress them out and cause mass mortality events. So I know these graphs may be um, intimidating, but I'll go over them after a little overview. So. For each protocol, I was able to get growth data, which I was able to then uh, perform a linear regression on this. I only used protocols A, B, and E because protocols C and D, uh, I was unable to collect enough data from those due to loss of replicates. Um, I looked at after 14 days post-hatch because all the protocols seemed to have relatively the same growth until flexion which was at 14 days. So I looked at the growth after flexion to compare. Um, and then also we found that there were large variations in the growth rate between protocols and large differences in survival between the protocols, indicating that the timing of these feeds and the type of feeds have a large impact on um, larval growth. So here we can see the length on the y-axis days post-hatch on the x-axis for protocols A through E. Protocol A, which was uh, developed as a yellow tang rearing protocol, had the highest growth rate by far with an average of uh, 0. over 0. 0.2 millimeters a day. And then protocol B followed and then protocol E at less than 0. 0.1 millimeters a day. So there was over a doubling of uh, growth rate from protocol E to protocol A, which is very interesting because the um, protocol for protocol A isn't designed to raise these species. Um, so I'll go into that a bit later. All of the regressions had a very high or relatively high R squared value and very low P values indicating that they were all significant. And then an ANCOVA was run between each protocol regression uh, finding that each protocol was significantly different from one another. So like I said, um, protocol A, while it had the highest uh, growth rate, had one of the lowest survival rates, which was very interesting uh, to see. But protocol B had a, almost three times that survival, and protocol E had about around the same. Um, so it was very interesting to look at the development of these protocols as we tried to mitigate the mass die-off effect. So we adjusted the timing of each feed, which seemed to uh, mitigate these mass die-off effects. Um, and like I said, it had a large difference on the survival. So. The weird findings in protocol A sort of contradict the bigger is better hypothesis, which states that a larger fish is 
more advantageous and will grow faster as it can you know ingest more food and has a shorter duration in um, vulnerable stages. So the theory is that protocol A uh, didn't fit this mold because of a difference in the first 10 days, it wasn't fed uh, a certain feed, uh, rotifers, and we think that this caused a large die-off event at the very beginning of the trial, which sort of compounded because these, because the fish left over in the tank had less competition, they were able to eat more per fish, which increased the growth rate and then compounded over the course of the study, uh, while the other trials didn't have that. So that's sort of why we think that happened. But also it was interesting to see that copepod, adult copepods were very, very important for larval growth. Um, while these are very, very intensive to culture, it's um, not very efficient for uh, the production. It's very important for the fish to have in conjunction with Artemia for survival. And also the mechanisms behind a lot of these mass die-offs we didn't really get to understand. So understanding those mass die-off events would be really helpful in creating a more tailored protocol for this species. But this study was the first time that this species had ever been raised in captivity and studied to this scale. So it was the first time that they were produced for consumers, which is a huge deal. And it was the first time that their larval duration had been uh, successfully documented and their whole development documented as well. So it really shows that this species and other species like it can be aquacultured so that they don't have to be taken out of the ocean. So it offers a viable alternative to wild collection for the aquarium industry. So hopefully these findings from this study can be applied to other reef species and even in the genus or other aquarium species in general. So just a little summary. Like I said, this led to the first potter's angelfish cohort produced for consumers ever. That's a huge deal um, as it shows that it's possible to produce this species so they don't have to be taken off of the reefs. Um, it also provides a framework for other species, which is super important uh, for the future of the aquarium industry going towards a sustainable future. And I would like to thank all of my peers for helping me throughout the years with this project. I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Callan, Dr. Theo for his continued input, and for Biota for funding this project with our ongoing uh, partnership with them. Thank you. Great questions. I have two. <laughs> um, the first one is the hypothesis of bigger is better. Um, is that one that is mostly used for uh, wild fish, or it's, is it also used for aquaculture? It's also been applied to aquaculture. It, so. it, did it originate for wild fish or aquaculture? Wild fish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because I was kind of thinking about that. It's like it, in the wild, it's so important to, you know, avoid predators mm -hmm. and it not just be bigger, but bigger, better, faster. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about like, hmm, does that, can we think of reasons why like it might not be so important aside from predators in aquaculture? Um, like the size difference? Yeah, why, well, why you don't have to be bigger, better? It's less about size and more about the time spent in vulnerable stages, like flexion. Um, so theoretically, a larger fish should be able to eat more and ingest more energy and grow faster mm -hmm. so that it's in those stages uh, for a short amount of time so that it can settle faster. So that's sort of the theory. Yeah. Um, but the size doesn't, you're right, the size doesn't really matter in this, uh, in normal aquaculture at least. Yeah, I was, I was kind of wondering if there's something to do about like the things that, because in the wild they get these diverse diets, right? Mm -hmm. But then in aquaculture, is it like, if they're getting bigger faster, it's because they're eating too much of one thing. It's a good question. Um, 
I personally like, like our team are terribly our team you don't quite compare to a nice wild diet, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that artemia are while they are a good food source, it's kind of like junk food for right, fish. Right. Yeah, it's like so, you get you get big from junk food. Yeah, so yeah. that's um, something that we've had to. That's also something uh, that in protocol A, seeing that difference in it had a really good growth rate but low survival. That's something um, that I think me and Chad talked about. Is like it's sort of like junk food for fish. Yeah. 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 My other question is: Are there any ideas like? why it gets this like really cool color pattern. It's like you see some fish, you know, predators in particular, you know, um, dark on top, white on bottom, but like mm -hmm. light in the front and dark in the back. And, and plus those blue lines are super cool. Like mm -hmm. any ideas like so, um, evolutionary or why that's... So the potter's angelfish along with the potter's grass have a very similar um, orange and blue uh, coloration, it's thought that the potter's wrasse actually was copying or mimicking the potter's angelfish, but um, it's supposed to be a, a trick mechanism uh, to kind of confuse predators because of the, it kind of blends in with the complex coral reef structure. So if something's chasing it from behind, they just mm -hmm. see these like blue line, wavy lines. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Oh, one more. Okay, so stick with me here. So, <laughs> so you did the study to try to find if these fish could be aquacultured for like aquariums and aquarium trade. So how could this be furthered into environmental conservation? Like could these fish be placed back into the wild in places that they would be beneficial? Or because of their food diets, would they just die? No, so while these species were um, collected heavily, they are still not like, their populations aren't endangered at all. So this isn't a good candidate for the release, which is what you're talking about. Um, however, uh, in my honors project, which this was a part of, I talked about how the findings from this study can be applied to policy um, actions from the state. So the state could theoretically fund more aquaculture programs and sort of um, use it as a green initiative, kind of like they did with solar and wind here, and show that it's a sustainable alternative um, that can replace the revenue loss from the fishery. Yeah, I think we will still want to do the replenish for things we want to eat. They are pretty cool looking, right? I don't know a lot about fish. <laughs> okay, uh, fabulous, thank you very much.